Dr. Ron Levi is an associate professor and researcher at the Australian National University who explores the intersection between public law and political theory. Specialising in deliberative democratic theory, Dr. Levi has won several academic awards and published numerous works on law and political theory in five countries. His recent projects explore referendums in deeply divided societies, indigenous constitutional reform and the deliberative dimensions of rights practice. With much of his work focusing on environmental constitutionalism, Dr. Levi will discuss how fixed constitutional commitments affect environmental outcomes. Thanks very much for the introduction um, and good to be with you all. Now I'm going to speak about fixed constitutional commitments and climate change in particular. But I'm going to start with uh, some definitions and uh, a bit of background. So what does all this mean? A, a fixed constitutional commitment uh, is an entrenched and enforceable uh, constitutional objective, something that might, for example, say we need to cut our carbon emissions by X amount by a given year. And this is actually something quite unusual in constitutional law. Um, but it's something that might actually become increasingly common. So in 2021, uh, the Australian state of Victoria constitutionally entrenched a ban on fracking or hydraulic fracturing, the kind of destructive um, search for coal seam gas underground. And when it did that, a handful of jurisdictions around the world in adopting what I call fixed constitutional commitments on the environment specifically. Now, a fixed constitutional commitment uh, protects the environment to a specific amount, a specific quantum. So for example, in Bhutan and Kenya and New York State, there are forest cover minimums. So Bhutan requires forests over 60% of the country at least. And that really differs quite a bit from other environmental constitutional laws. Now, environmental constitutional laws are very common. Since uh, Portugal uh, in the 1970s entrenched a set of environmental protections, about 100 other constitutions have followed suit. Now, that has not been enough. Uh, we are still on track for catastrophic climate change, as many recent reports make clear. The one that you see on the screen now is just one of several that um, give us a sort of range of possible temperature increases and uh, and Obviously, the, the greater the temperature increase, the more worrying. Now, it's not too surprising that all these hundred plus constitutional commitments in countries around the world have not yet got us out of the situation that we're in. They haven't saved the uh, saved our environment quite so much as we would have hoped. But to observers of constitutions, that's not this is, this is quite a common thing. Constitutional laws are not always effective. And one of the reasons for that is that they are quite broad and vague. In fact, they're broad and vague by design. They try not to firm up very specific fixed levels of policy. Instead, they tend to enunciate very aspirational goals, we say, um, missions, general principles. So South Africa's Bill of Rights includes at Article 24, the right to an environment that's not harmful to people's health or well-being, and the right to have the environment protected. Now, elsewhere, we see rights to a healthy environment or obligations to protect and improve the environment in international law and in domestic legislation and in constitutional provisions. The, this level of vagueness is quite common. There's a lot of room for other concerns, economic concerns, for example, to intercede. Why do constitutional entrenched provisions, when I say entrenched, I mean they're difficult to repeal. So they're very difficult to change. Why are they so vague? Why so broad? Well, it's a strategy that tends to leave democracy with a lot of room to breathe. So the people through their representatives especially are meant to fill in the details within the constitution. So in the, the paper that I've based this talk on, I call this a uh, form of uh, proceduralism. So what we have is not specific substance in the constitution, but a procedure, a democratic procedure for figuring things out in the future. It's 
prospective. It's looking to the future. Um, we're not looking to lock up a set of policies in the, in the past, but we're looking to begin a policy conversation under the broad terms of the Constitution. Now, the problem with that, though, is that we're in a big rush. We need to finish that conversation and move on to, to action at some point. If you have too much of this proceduralism, it might keep us mired at square one on complex matters. So with the climate, for instance, we need consistent policy and we need it to be sustained over many changes of government over time. Uh, we can't be constantly reassessing our commitments or wondering whether we should commit at all. We need to do so uh, quickly in order to move forward. Now, imagine for instance, that you had a fixed constitutional commitment on climate change in a national constitution, net zero carbon by the year 2040, let's say. Now, maybe you could also enforce that in the courts, and I can talk about some of the specifics of, of how that could happen. In the paper, I, I consider some objections to this. Why shouldn't we do this? Because in order to make a good argument for it, we also have to understand why we wouldn't want to do it. Now, in, uh, in Victoria, where they had the anti-fracking entrenchment, one of the opposition MPs, members of parliament, said that it was undemocratic and maybe has a point. Uh, again, constitutions tend to have vagueness to leave room for democracies to breathe. So maybe a fixed constitutional commitment undermines that prospective proceduralist constitutional model. And maybe it undermines democracy too much. But in the paper, I offer some replies to this so-called objection from democracy. Now, the first one I don't really agree with, but some people might say, well, look, we're in an existential emergency. We have to justify drastic measures, even if it means rolling back democracy to some extent. Because um, as it's sometimes said, being comes before well-being. You know, it's all well and good to have these democratic procedures and a vague constitution and so on, but what if that leads us to our destruction? Now, the problems with that are, well, it's, it's quite dangerous. When do we roll back democracy? Should we do that? And if we do do it, don't we lose what is fundamental to us in a democratic society? Isn't it dangerous? Now, the, the other arguments though, so that, that first argument was that fixed constitutional commitments are justified by existential emergencies, even if they impede democracy. But the other arguments are that, in fact, they don't impede democracy. In fact, they correct processes of democracy. We need something like a fixed constitutional commitment to improve our democracy. So, for example, we have malrepresentation, and maybe it will improve that. Maybe it'll uh, fix what, what I'm calling malrepresentation, which is basically a mismatch between what the people want and what their representatives are actually giving them. So in many countries, including Australia, elected representatives are doing a strikingly poor job of representing citizen, citizen preferences. Up to 80% of Australians want significant climate uh, mitigation action. But uh, until very recently, very little had ha actually happened. Even now, we're, we're not quite where we need to be. So you know, despite overwhelming popular support for an adequate response to the climate emergency, many politicians drag their feet. Um, and uh, partly it's because of the partisanship of our political processes. Many of our representatives understand their real constituents as perhaps the businesses that underwrite their electoral campaigns. Now, that's it seems like a cynical point of view, but in fact, there's, there's quite a bit of um, uh, empirical work to demonstrate this. Legislatures are also, and here's another problem, they're focused on the present day. But what about the future interests of the generations that will come after us? Those generations hopefully will be, no, will be more numerous than our own. And so to what extent are we actually underrepresenting the generations of the future? Now, these malrepresentations between our present um, interests in climate change mitigation and what we're actually getting through our legislatures, and also the malrepresentation between future generations, what they need, and what we're, what we're getting through our legislatures. These are problems of democracy, problems with the process of democracy. So maybe a fixed climate uh, constitutional commitment could act as a dem democratic corrective that imposes the kinds of decisions that representative democracy would have reached 
had certain demonstrable faults, some certain faults in the process of democracy not been there. Okay, so that's, that's one argument. There's also a second reason for thinking that fixed constitutional climate commitments might be pro-democratic, positive for democracy. And that's that before a, a society can deliberate about policy, it has to settle its essential priorities. A democracy that can't move beyond priority setting may be unable to go on to deliberate about specifics of policy. And that's where the more numerous policy questions tend, tend to arise. So for example, on the environment, uh, broad policy objectives require a certain amount of trial and error, a lot of investment and so on. Now in the United, sorry, in the uh, European Union, um, develop it toward, development towards emissions trading schemes never really got off of the ground until governments finally agreed to firm up certain commitments to uh, emissions trading. And once that happened, then the policy around uh, climate change mitigation was able to, to really take off. So there's there's fair much of evidence that that certainty, that policy uh, priority setting is really important before we actually move on to, to more numerous policy questions that we have. And um, the, the idea here, it, it's actually deeply rooted in, in our democracies. The idea that we, um, we give up some of our uh, freedoms, for example, in order to receive certain um, benefits in return, the social contract, for example. So those of you who are familiar with that might, uh, might, might recognize that there's, there's a certain need to, to, um, to fix certain commitments in order to benefit in other ways. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm uh, suggesting here, that fixed constitutional commitments can enable deliberation about policy specifics and policy implementation that otherwise might not get off the ground. They may widen in net overall the degrees of freedom for deliberation in our society by setting certain priorities. However, you know, sorry, I'll, I'll move on. We can't take this idea too far, um, this idea of democratic correction through fixed constitutional commitments. It could be that as the objection noted earlier, that fixed commitments Imp impede, they impact upon democracy more than is appropriate. In the past, there have been strong constitutional commitments that did do that. Um, if, if any of you are lawyers, you might uh, be familiar with the Lochner era 100 years ago in the United States. That's an example of, of when judges and constitutions really do impede democracy. On the other hand, we, we do have to consider whether these kinds of tools can help to shore up our democracy, as I've suggested. Because our democracies are too prone to division, they're too slow moving, they're unable to take coherent action on long-term problems such as climate change. So I've, I've got Joe Biden here. Shortly after he took power, he gave a speech in the UK where he said this, I believe we're at an inflection point in world history, the moment where it falls to us to prove that democracies will not just endure, but they will excel as we rise to seize the enormous opportunities of a new age. We have to discredit those who believe that the age of democracy is over, as some of our fellow nations believe. We have to expose as false the narrative that decrees of dictators can match the speed and scale of the 21st century challenges. So in essence, he's saying we have to address the challenges that democracies are facing, division, misinformation, disinformation, and so on. The problem with things like climate is that they're so complex that it's easy, relatively, to exploit uh, weaknesses of democracy to engage in disinformation, for example. And so we need, seemingly, we need new tools to avoid these policymaking quagmires that have kept us in our democratic systems from really beginning to address the chronic emergency of climate, for example, adequately. The best solutions will not be ones that are authoritarian, but ones that preserve and actually shore up and, and make democracy actually thrive. Uh, more than it has been able to do in the past. Now, um, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, if you're interested in, in this topic, then you can find the, the full work on this. Um, it's actually free and able, it, yeah, you can freely access it at the Melbourne University Law Review. So thank you very much.